Welcome everyone to the first UARC meeting online of January in 2022. I guess it would be the only UARC meeting in January of 2022. So uh, Morris, unmute yourself and uh, say hello to everyone. Welcome everybody to 2022. I honestly never thought I'd live this long, but <laughs> unfortunately I did. Uh, anyway, I I think I'm excited about tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, I, I love antennas, and we have uh, perhaps the best person we could possibly get to do it. So, back to you. All right, sounds good. Let's see. We have our, well, as they used to say, the peanut gallery on the YouTube chat, if you have any questions anytime along, whether or not it be related to the presentation, please put them there and we'll eventually notice them. Um, let's see, we have uh, Mr. Ron Jones, uh, KE6SLS, uh, Glenn Worthington, Ryan McGee. Let's see, um, who's one of our, who along with Mike and KI7MTI is one of our, one of our two of our, they are two our two new board members for this year, the program chairpersons, and we're happy to have them. We have W7SAE, uh, Mark, WU7F, W7TKG, uh, AE4KR, KK7DV, and AE3 Delta Charlie with us. And we're glad to have you here. Looks like we have about 37 people uh, online at the moment. Let's see here. Morris, you have a few pieces of club business to bring up as well as classes. Uh, start on with that. Okay. Uh, it turns out that last month, uh, though we did have the election for the two program chairs that we uh, had competition for, uh, we didn't elect the rest of the board. And the general procedure for doing that in a case where there are no other um, candidates for the offices is um, for someone to make a nominate a, a motion that the secretary be directed to appoint the uh, board as it stands. So, would somebody like to make that? Uh, motion I, do. I, uh, I would hereby move that we elect by acclamation the uh, other group of board members that uh, we did not vote on last uh, last meeting because there were no other candidates okay uh, we have a quorum present uh, those that are in favor say aye may I wave our hands and raise our uh, hands will do Okay. Uh, yep. Directed, Tom. You're directed to do that. I can do that. I'll get that noted in our uh, into our minutes for the meeting. Okay. Thank you. One other pleasurable activity that I get to do uh, on an annual basis, or at least the club president gets to do, is to um, review those. Uh, nominations for uh, member of the year for the York Club. And this year, we um, couldn't quite, I, I couldn't quite decide uh, which of the ones that we had nominated were the best. So I chose two of them. So we are pleased to announce that we have two hams. Uh, that are selected as York Members of the Year. The first one is John Lloyd, K7JL. John uh, is that person that is in the background keeping many of the repeaters 
on the inner tie up and running. Uh, nobody really thinks about him when things are working fine and they don't realize how much effort he puts into keeping them that way. And we are really, really pleased to be able to uh, have him as a member of the year. Our second member of the year is a member of our board. It is Clint Turner, K-A-7-O-E-I. Clint, wave your hands. <laughs> He's the one that talks most of the time. Uh, Clint is the uh, technical, these are my words here. This is not any of the nominees' words. Clint is the technical genius that helped design and implement the Northern Utah Web SDR, uh, design the coordinated part of uh, the 146.62 coordinated repeater, and has been a major force in implementing uh, the Lemington Remote High Frequency Radio site, uh, especially the antenna parts. We are pleased and proud to recognize John and Clint as the Utah Amateur Radio Club Members of the Year. Now we're waiting applaud to go die down here. Okay, also, the last thing I have to say is just to remind everybody that the online technician and general courses begin next week. Uh, technician and, and uh, technician class is on Monday and the general is on Wednesdays. Uh, also, Ron Spears, K7RLS, is offering an in-person extra course starting on Tuesday, January 25th. If you're interested or you know anybody that's interested, please get with me sooner than possible. Uh, I will be sending out invitations to the class on Saturday, so please get me the information of anybody interested in taking these courses uh, by this Saturday. You can do that by sending it to my email, ad7sr, that's Alpha Delta 7 Sierra Romeo, at arrl.net. And with that, we are back to our member of the year, Clint. Well, thank you very much. Uh, don't know what to say. That caught me a bit by surprise, but when you said two, and I hadn't heard of it before, I think... <laughs> Start getting a clue here. Um, we do have some sad news to report. Uh, those of you who have been around for a long time have remember a fixture on the air. Venus KB7FXB passed away, we're pretty sure on the 4th, about a, around a week ago. Uh, I believe she was, uh, was she 94 or 96? Um, you're muted, Morris. 96. 96 which is a good run for everyone, for anyone, but uh, we were certainly pleased to have her. She, I don't know when she got licensed, but, but I'm guessing by the call, she probably got licensed in the, around 1990 or 1980 as a novice. So, you know, I guess, I, mean, I guess Venus had to know the code to do, you know, back then, to at least five words a minute, but everybody remembers her or, and will remember her as, a sane voice on the air that would kindly correct new hams if they messed up to the point where they didn't even know they were being corrected, perhaps. And always a good voice to hear on the air uh, and someone to talk to. So we will miss her. Uh, so anyway, uh, what can you say? But we're, we're pleased that she was around as long as she was. On a... Uh, on an unrelated note, there's a, two technical issues I'll bring up. As you might know, the IRLP node on the 7.6 repeater died around the 22nd or 23rd. Between the holidays, the fact that the computer with it had failed catastrophically after a mere 156,000 hours of operation. I mean, computers these days. Uh, you know, it failed catastrophically. It had been, the computer had been on almost continuously since early 2004 or, or so, or late 2003. 
and it finally gave up the ghost. And as you may know, there's quite a bit of custom hardware associated with the peculiar needs of the 7.6 repeater. So a big, huge desktop, well, an older, not a very big desktop, had to was finally reduce to something like this, a Raspberry Pi. And this, this board here it makes it look like there's still the parallel port from the PC that we had. And, and uh, after working with the IRLP folks to help recover some of the software and configuration, a process that in itself took a little bit over a week. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, if family obligations permit, I'll be able to get the thing up and running maybe tomorrow night, assuming that the other ham who provides access for the building where downtown Salt Lake, where this re where the equipment is stored, has time to do so. And finally, um, one of the things that's worth noting too, mentioning too, is um, there's a new SDR here in Utah. Let me bring it up. Oh, new web SDR. And uh, let's see. So let me share the screen. And people might find this useful. So if you don't know what a web SDR is, it's a thing where you just go with your browser and you can tune a remote receiver. You and maybe 100 other people can tune a remote receiver. It's a sdrutah.org and there you'll find this landing page and there's other ones here but the one i'd like to point out is the salt lake metro uhf vhf one which has the color of peach ish sort of you know as peach as computers will be this one here is located at the qth of glenn wa7x in east mill creek so it has a good view of the valley let's see gotta move that over and its whole purpose in life is to just listen to all of two meters in the top four megahertz of 450. And we're working on adding a narrow segment that's specifically optimized for two meter Earth and space, like the ISS and some of the satellites. It's all mode, AM, FM, CW, and all that. What I would like to bring your attention to is uh, we've added I've added to the code this right here. There's a deviation meter. So if I click here on the 7 8 repeater, we can see whoever's talking has a peak deviation of about 4 kilohertz, which is a reasonable level. So if you see your level below about 3 kilohertz, if you're being listened to, you probably need to either get close to the microphone or figure out how to crank up your mic gain. And it also shows the apparent peak signal and noise ratio, but it looks like either the repeater is noisy or transmitting a PL tone that's making the minimum deviation hard to measure. But anyway, that's uh, that's that. It's free for, for anyone to use, and it's uh, here in, just intended for covering the Salt Lake repeaters. Uh, so um, feel free to try it out. I think it's currently configured to support 25 people, but if in the unlikely event more people get on there at one time, then we can uh, bump that up. All right, I don't think there's anything else for us to cover. Uh, Mike uh, M, well, Mike Mladojowski, there's two Mike Ms on the Zoom call at the moment. Prepare to unmute yourself and introduce yourself and tell us what you're gonna tell us. Okay, hi there. This is Mike M, Mike Mladojowski. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, English is not my native language, so you'll have to excuse me. I'm an immigrant to the country a long time ago with an ancient history from Europe and Australia. Anyway, I lived in Salt Lake most of my adult life and worked at the University of Utah, was a former officer, and I think I had probably almost every office in Newark at one point or another. And I'm also well known around the Utah VHF Society. So uh, moved out of Utah about 11, 12 years ago, moved to Arizona in retirement to get away from the snow. And our mornings here are typically colder than you, you guys in Salt Lake. So uh, I'm not sure it worked, but we don't get snow and keep it. Back to you, uh, Clint. All right. Thanks. Um, I guess 
Let's see. Are you ready to just launch into your presentation? Sure, if you're if you're ready, and I, I'll I'll give the title and t explain what I'm talking about. Right, and it's worth noting that some of the, what Mike will be talking about, he covered several months ago. Um, hey, Tom, look up when Mike gave the last presentation uh, about antenna simulation specifically, because that dovetails nicely with what he is going to talk about tonight. Okay, well, here's my welcome slide. And basically what I'm going to talk about is this, if you've been following the ham circus, uh, it seemed like these NFED halfway multiband HF antennas are all the rage. And so I thought I'd kind of explain how they work, what they do, and where you might apply them and give some examples of some of the hardware uh, give some availability of bits and pieces like from uh, your, your backyard and so on. So without further ado, let's just get into it. A good place to start to explain how these things work is to first show you some things about a standard old little dipole, you know, the novice 468 over F. So if we're going to design a, a dipole for 40 meters, we get something that's around 60 feet long. So what I did is I put this into my antenna modeler. I'm using Easy Neck with the Neck 2 engine. And by the way, uh, I've been one of the beta testers of the soon to be released free version of Easy Neck with the Neck 2 engine. Uh, the guy that has been selling it and supporting it all these years is retiring and he's gonna throw it over the wall as a public domain piece of software for anybody to download and use. And so at that point, uh, I, I suspect we'll have a whole lot more model questions about how to model antennas. But for the, uh, uh, for the interim, uh, I'm gonna use it to show principles of how things work. Not, this is not an explanation of how to model. This is an explanation of using the modeler as a tool to demonstrate things. So back to our dipole. Uh, in the model, there are a couple of variables, the length end to end, the height above dirt, what kind of wire, what kind of insulation on the wire, uh, diameter of the wire, copper wire losses, etc. So let's, without further ado, we'll just simply go here. And I've created a base model that's 60 feet long. And I'll, to see what it does, all I have to do is say calculate all rows or calculate selected row. And it came right back and said, hey, dummy, a 60-foot wire is way capacitive. What does that tell us? It's too short. So we could try making it longer. How about 66 feet? Doing it again. Oh, sorry. Calculate all rows again. And I reduced the capacitive reactance of the antenna by making it longer. But there's an even easier way. If I simply select the length and say resonate, it does it for me. And it says, oh, if you made this wire 65.44 feet long, guess what? It would have a resistance of 75 ohms. It would be pure, perfectly resonant, meaning that the reactive term is zero. And it would have a VSWR of 1.5 to one with respect to a 50 ohm system. Now this is important. We, all of our transceivers and coax and everything is designed around a 50 ohm system. But here what I'm showing you is that if you build a backyard dipole and put it, made it 65 feet long and this one happens to be 30 feet above average ground, if you did that, the lowest SWR the antenna would present is about one and a half to one. So no matter what you do to that wire, cut it long, make it, make it longer, make it shorter, you're never going to get below this VSWR. Now, is that good enough? Well, sure it is. My ICOM 7300 would work with a, with a uh, uh, antenna that's up to about two, two to one. So if you once get the SWR established at the antenna and all you do is hook 50 ohm coax to it, and then you hook it to a 50 ohm radio, the system SWR is defined at the antenna, not, not anywhere else. So 
When you're designing antennas, the goal is to always try to get them fairly close to that. Okay, so let's let's uh, show a couple of things, a couple of other things about that. I've showed how to resonate it. Let me just show you one other thing about this particular antenna, and that is, we'll go to the where where patterns. What I did is I pre-computed pre the pattern of this antenna at. Uh, four different heights, 60 feet above ground, 45 feet above ground, 30 feet. This says 30, but it should say 20. So 20, 30, 45, and 60 feet. Now look at the, at, look at the elevation pattern of this antenna. If you put it low to the ground, the light blue color, the antenna doesn't do as well because the pattern is smaller, doesn't radiate as much. It radiates more straight up and less off the sides. If you make the antenna 60 feet high, which most hams would have a hard time doing in their backyard, look what happens. You eliminate almost all of the overhead uh, radiation and you put, most, put a lot more of the radiation out here on the sides. So this is a much better DX antenna and probably a much better antenna even from talking from here to Salt Lake because those angles or those signals launch at about maybe 30 degrees or 25 degrees, somewhere in here. So the lower you can get this lobe, the better off you are. Okay, next slide. Uh, I showed you that an antenna impedance has two parts, a real part and a reactive part. And the reactive part, the real part's always a positive number, but the reactive part can have a plus or minus sign. If the reactive part of the feed point impedance of an antenna is capacitive, that generally means it's too short and it needs to be lengthened to make it closer to resonance. Uh, conversely, if it's got a plus sign, it's inductive, it's too long. Now that holds for a center-fed half-wave dipole. It won't hold once we start talking about end-fed antennas. Those are backwards, interestingly enough. Okay, another aspect of an antenna is that it has to act like a load resistor to a transmitter. So you can talk about voltage, current, and power that it radiates or takes from the transmitter or from the feed line. We talked about this. Now, either the R term or the X term being elevated or, or other than, well, R being other than 50 ohms and, and X being other than zero ohms affects the SWR. So uh, we talked about SWR relative to what? a nominal system impedance of say 50 ohms. So how do you find the nominal impedance of an antenna? Well, one, one way is to simulate it and let the simulator tell you based on computation, or you can measure it with something like a rig expert or a nano VNA. Uh, here's the show and tell. I was going to unshare here and hold up if in case you have never seen one. That's a nano VNA. That's an antenna impedance measure amongst other things. It'll measure the R and X part of an antenna impedance. Costs about 50 bucks. Uh, here's a much better tool to do the same thing. It's my rig expert antenna analyzer. It's basically a single port only, but it works up to 600 megahertz. It, it will plot R and X and SWR and all that stuff, save it in files. You can you hook it to a computer through a USB and all of that stuff. Okay, sharing screen again. Uh, I think we're back. Tell me if, yeah, I'm back. Okay, next slide is, so when you'll see that most of the models I show you tonight are pieces of wire with a source and they don't include coax in the model intrinsically. Is that okay? Well. If a transmission line is placed symmetrically with respect to an antenna, then it generally doesn't impact the near field of the antenna very much. So you don't really need to model your coax explicitly. If, if you have coax that isn't symmetrically placed, it's okay to leave it out of the model as long as you do something to prevent induced currents that would normally flow on the outside of that coax from disturbing or perturbing the model. Okay, in a real world antenna, sometimes a real dipole that's coax fed needs a choke. Uh, I'll explain why in a minute. 
if you're building a fan dipole, which is one of these things that has multiple wires parallel so that it recruits multiple bands like 40, 20, 15, and 10, if you try to build one and you leave off the choke between the coax and the center part of that antenna, it's a bitch to get all of those wires uh, resonant. But if you put a choke in it, it almost imme- uh, completely solves that problem. Now, the NFED antenna is kind of a special case. It's asymmetric as hell. The coax comes off one end. And so when do you need a choke on an NFED? Well, I'm going to show a slide about that later. But basically, if you have RF in the shack, you need a choke. That's the ultimate uh, ultimate thing. Um, a lot of people put up NFED antennas without chokes, and they get by with it. So I would try it without first. And, and if you end up with some RF uh, where you don't want it, that's the time to add a choke. And I'll show where to add the choke. Okay. There's just a general point I want to make about choking coax right here. And that is in today's modern world where we have houses full of switching power supplies and wall warts and washing machines and heating systems and every other blasted thing that has a switching supply in it, all of which powered off the AC line. And that AC line is connected to your rig through the power supply. And then the rig is connected to your coax and the coax goes to the antenna. If you choke the heck out of the coax feed line between the rig and the antenna, frequently that improves the resting receiver noise level. You hear less of the hash from the switching power supplies that your house is full of. So remember that point. It's uh, it's really important in, in today's age. That's something that started happening to us about 1980 or 85 because of all of the switching supplies. Okay. We talked about higher is better for a standard dipole. We showed how to resonate it. We sh- Let's do a sweep of a dipole across the 40 meter band. To, to that end, I need another model. So I'm just gonna get it. Uh, that one. I've got these pre-canned so I don't have to waste a whole lot of time. And uh, so let me show you what it looks like. Uh, let's see, calculate. We'll go to this middle of the band and view the antenna. Again, it's just a standard old dipole with a source in the middle. That's where the coax would normally hook up. And it's 40 meters, so it's about 60, what did I say, about 65 feet. We, if we uh, run it one time in the middle of the band, we notice that I already knew what the length was because the reactance is zero. So. That's a, uh, about as low an SWR as that dipole is going to have at the height it is over what kind of dirt it is and so on. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I want to sweep the entire band. I'm going to go from 7 megahertz to 7.3. And what the calculator did or the simulator did is it shows me how the reactance is changing across the band and how the resistance is changing and how the SWR is changing. Well, it's really easy to visualize this, or it's easier to visualize this if you look at plots instead of raw numbers. And uh, notice here, the blue line is the, res- is the resistance of this particular dipole across the 40 meter band. And it's pretty flat. It only goes from eight, you know, 78 ohms to maybe 84 ohms, 88 ohms or something like that. But the reactive part is changing f- quite rapidly. Now, when we get to the NFED, it turns out those are exactly reversed. In an in a NFED antenna, the reactance is flat and the resistance is changing rapidly. Okay, let me see what else I was going to show you on that slide. Um, pat- oh, patterns. Let's quickly look at patterns. Uh, so here is the uh, pattern of that dipole at the bottom end of the band at 7 megahertz. And if I rapidly go through all of the the whole 40 meter band, comparing it to the first plot, which is blue, you notice that the red one just barely becomes visible. So the pattern isn't changing at all across the band. That's the bottom line. Um, Let's see, what else? Oh, this is an interesting one. If we look at the, uh, some of you may remember how to use a Smith chart. This is kind of an esoteric way of displaying antenna impedance. 
But basically what's going on here is, again, I can sweep from 7 to 7, 7.025. So I'm changing from one end of the band to the other. And it turns out, it, remember, I designed this to have the lowest SWR near the middle of the band, around 7150. That's where the green dot is. Well, it turns out on a Smith chart, this constant green circle is an SWR of, of 2. So any feed point impedance of R and JX plotted on this chart landing inside the green circle has an SWR of less than two. My transmitter will talk to a, uh, a load that is uh, SWR of less than two. So basically it's a quick way to visualize whether or not my transceiver could talk to this antenna. Well, it turns out there's only one, one or two points that are just on the edges of the circle down here. So by and large, that dipole is good enough to use without turning on the tuner inside my radio. That's the important part here, is the antenna is good enough that it doesn't need the tuner on most places. Okay, one, or, one other thing about this dipole that's somewhat interesting, and that is it has a current standing wave from end to end. This represents the length of the dipole along here, and this represents the current at every point along the dipole. Remember this, we're sweeping this dipole from one end of the 40 meter band to the other, and if I do that rapidly, you see that the pattern of, or the shape of that current is not changing hardly at all uh, across the 40 meter band. It, it is pretty much the same. So the antenna works just about as well at one end of the band as it does the other, even if the SWR goes up. Okay. Oh, heck, where I lost my point. Uh, I clicked on the wrong thing. So... We showed you that. So the next thing I want to talk about is let's take that same dipole. And this is, requires a new model. So I have to forget the old model. No, I don't want to save it. I want to load a new one, which is that one. And OK, so what I did here is I took that same 40 meter dipole and I started at 6 megahertz and I went all the way to 30 megahertz. Uh, to a quarter megahertz increments. There's actually 92 iterations of the model there. And I don't want to make you wait for that. So let's go look at the SWR of that 40 meter wire across that whole spectrum from seven below seven megahertz all the way to above the 10 meter band at 30 megahertz. Now we designed the antenna to work at 40 meters. So the SWR right in the middle of the 40 meter band is really low. It's right there. Okay, as you go higher in frequency, it, it skips over 20 meters. It's, the SWR is real high. And then remember, some of you might remember that 40 meter dipoles can be used on 15 meters. Well, yes and no. Notice that the 40 meter dipole misses the 15 meter band by quite a bit. Now you could kind of stagger tune it by moving this point outside the band down here. That would move this point a little lower and maybe you could kind of half bridge both bands. But the reality is that, that you got to work pretty hard to make a, a 40 meter dipole work on 15 meters. It's not ideal. It'll sort of work. Okay. Again, by the time, by the way, the, the reason I'm showing you this is that's seven megahertz. That's 14, that's twice that. This is 21 megahertz, that's three times that. And this is 28 megahertz, that's four times that. So this is the fundamental, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic. Is that right? Did I say that right, Clint? Yep, he's nodding his head. Okay, um, let's see what's, we've shown you that we're spanning all those bands, okay? I've shown you the perfect SWR on 40. Now, I showed you the SWR relative to a system impedance of 50 ohms. What would happen if all we do is switch the system reference level impedance to 4,000? Not changing the antenna, not changing anything except just the mathematics of how to represent the data. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'll go to the calculate page and change that one number right there to 4,000 instead of 50. And I'm gonna replot the SWR of that antenna. 
So we'll go to that guy. Now, remember that it was designed for 40 meters at a low SWR and at a very high SWR on 20. But all I did was take that wire and look at it a different way. And all of a sudden, the, the SWR is really low on 20 and 10 meters, and it's high on the bands where it was formerly low. This is important. We're getting to the end fed. You see, you see where this is headed? Okay. Um, I'll show you the uh, resistance value as a function of that wide frequency sweep. Notice that where we thought we were going to use the antenna on 40 meters, and we wanted the S we wanted the R to be about 50 ohms. That's what you see here. It's it's way down there. But look where it is at 20 meters. It's way in the heck up here, about 4,000 ohms. Likewise, on near 15, it's close to our 50 ohms. But up on 10 meters, it's it's uh, between 3,500 and 4,000. So even though we can make the SWR low, the feed point impedance of the antenna is way up there. Um, let's see, what else did I want to show you? So this sets, the, this sets us up for eventually feeding a wire through a high impedance transformer. That's why I wanted you to show, that's why I wanted to show you this. Uh, maybe we can utilize all four of the resonances if we play or hold our mouth right. Okay, so here we go. We're going to now take our dipole and modify it again. So I want to dump this simulation. Close that. No, I want to load this one. Okay. And what I want to show you is, let's see, on the calculate page, I'm going to execute that model one time and view the antenna. So this is our 40 meter dipole. Center fed, the source is in the middle, two legs either side roughly a quarter wavelength each. But look what I did in this, in this set of run, simulation runs. I defined two variables and the variable M is the long leg of the dipole and, and, and N is the short leg. Well, right here, they're approximately equal. But if I go further down this chart, Let's say we move the feet point so that we're 60 feet in from one end of roughly a 67 foot wire. That leaves about seven feet on the other short wire. Look what the impedance did. At every point along here, I've already resonated the antenna. So the uh, reactive term of the feet point impedance is very close to zero because I made it so by adjusting the two lengths. But I wanted to show you that you can take our dipole, which formerly had a, a feed point impedance around 75 ohms-ish, and you can get any feed point impedance within reason between about 75 and about 3,500 ohms just by moving the feed point down the wire and then finding the links on either side of the feed point that bring the antenna to resonance. So again, this is heading, this is another nail in the coffin of how we get to an NFED antenna. Bear with me. We're getting there. Uh, <clears throat> what did I want to show you about? I showed you, oh, if you look at my table here, you notice that one of these entries is very close to 2,500 or 2,450 ohms. And I set my system target reference impedance to 2450. You see that number right there. So if I go look at the SWR of this antenna as a function of the long leg. So remember in the, in the first iteration, we had about 33 feet either side of the feed point, that's here. And I'm moving the feed point closer and closer and closer to the other end of the wire. And at right at that point, there's a magic point where I got a, uh, about a 60, what is that? About a 64 foot wired, long wire. And I've got a short, uh, I don't know what that, what is that? About a couple of feet long on the, or three feet long on the other side. And all of a sudden the SWR went to nothing. And that's, a, or it went to one, not nothing, one. Let's be accurate. So that's the gist of where we're headed. We are basically taking our dipole, we're sliding the feed point towards one end. Now, I want to show the picture of that. I'll pick the one that has that impedance. Where was it? That one. I'll 
execute the model and view the antenna. Okay, so there's what it looks like after we've slid that feed point all the way down the wire. Now, is the wire or is the feed point at the end of the wire? No, it isn't. There always has to be a piece over here. And look at that current distribution. Does that look like the current distribution we used to have on a center-fed dipole? It turns out it's exactly the same bloody thing. Let me show you. So for that particular uh, iteration or that particular offset of the feed point, if we go to this uh, picture, this shows us the currents again on the segments of the wire. Now there's a little kind of a wiggle down here. Let me run through all of them just so you see what's going on. I'm gonna start with, okay, case one right here, that case one, that's the one where the wire is fed in the center. So both legs of equal length. So there I move the, the feed point a little bit that way, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And the case that I think I wanted to show you is about here. That's about where the 2450 ohm transformer is eventually gonna feed this thing. And if you go a little too far, something kind of bizarre happens. And that's, you get this, this slope changes on that current on that tail. That's, that's a little too far. So that's where you try to drive the antenna at maybe 3,000 or 3,500 ohms. That's a bad place. So back up to about the 2,000 ohm range, and that's about what you're seeing here. Okay, it still looks like the current distribution on a half-wave dipole. It's got a little bit of a bend in, the, in that end, but it, but it hasn't changed much. Okay, patterns, same bloody thing. If you look at the, uh, the, I'll start my cases here. Case one is the symmetric dipole. I'm gonna, uh, let's see, erase this, take the snapshot of that. So this is a center fed dipole uh, azimuth pattern looking down at it from above and it radiates better, the antenna lays along this axis so it radiates better broadside. Uh, now I'm just, changing the feed point position. And you notice that almost all of the cases look the same. There is very little difference between uh, feeding down near the end or feeding near the middle. The current distribution is the same. The pattern is the same. It's, that's antenna theory 101. It's gotta be that way. Okay. Um, so now we're ready to add the transformer to the antenna. So I'm gonna open yet another model. This one has a transformer connected at a break in the wire where the source was before. So let's do that. Kill this one, load. Oh, what happened to my model? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What I gotta read the instructions here. Oh, I gotta use the same model I had except load a different file. I forgot that. One little step. So I gotta go back to five proto. And yes, oops, five proto, uh, best laid plans, enable macro. Okay, now I'm gonna load in the actual model with the transformer in it. And that's that one right there. Okay, so if we look at, if we look at the model, nothing much has changed except that we still got most of the wire on one side, a little short tail, but instead of having a source here, what we have now is the actual transformer. And the way that uh, you show that in, in uh, the modeler is you create a transformer, which is an insertable object. And you tell it that the port one side has got 50 ohm impedance, port two is, fit, is uh, 2,450 ohms. And by the way, where does that number come from? I'll explain that in a minute. It's a, a normal transformer. And the source that formerly used to connect to wire uh, to uh, wire to a halfway point is now connected to the input of the transformer. So that's, that's the only thing we've done. And it works exactly the same way, except that notice now the system impedance is 50 ohms. And the SWRs are roughly the same as they were 
when before I added the transformer with respect to 2,450 ohms. So we added the transformer and now we could hook coax to the input side of that transformer and everybody would be happy because the SWRs are ranging between the best one I see here is one and 1 1.5 at each of the band edges. So let's quickly show that there's SWR versus frequency. And there you go. Uh, if I turn off that scaling, you notice it, it looks kind of like the dipole, except remember the dipole, the lowest we could get is about one and a half to one. So the dipole kind of went through here and back up. It was about the same at the edges, but it was much higher in the middle. The end fed with the transformer or near end fed is capable of matching an arbitrary wire to just about a perfect one-to-one -one SWR, which is what it's going on right there. Okay, uh, so we've set ourselves up to where we can feed it with a transformer. The transformer that we'd like to use has a 2450 ohm secondary impedance. Well, transformers, you talk about their turns ratio and the impedance ratio of a transformer is uh, the ratio of the of the turns squared. So if it's a one to seven turns ratio, the impedance ratio is one to 49 and 49 times 50 on the input is 2450 on the output. So that's where the transformer specification comes from. Now, usually when you build ferrite transformers, I'm gonna show this on the next slide. Usually you build them instead of one and seven turns, you usually use two and 14 or possibly three and 21. But if it's two and 14, there's two ways to wind your transformer. One is to build two independent windings. The other is to build it like an auto transformer where you have two turns and then you have 12 turns added in series with the previous two to get the 14 on the output. So here's some real transformers. Now here, this transformer picture shows this AARL HF kits uh, transformer that you can buy in kit form. The uh, AWRL started selling this kit, kit end fed antenna about uh, what's well, going on about nine months ago. And they were sold out initially. I, I managed to pick one up and I built a cup, I built it and tested it. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Here is a, uh, an end fed transformer that I built. Uh, I, did, I did a little differently. You notice that in the AWRL model, they have you twist the two primary turns together. Uh, in my version, I add 12 turns in series with the two primary turns. I use heavy wire for the primary turns because the current in the primary turns is seven times higher than the current in the secondary. The voltage is high at the output of, this, of the transformer, but the current is one seventh of what the current would have been for at the input. So. Uh, it makes more sense to me to use heavy wire for the two primary turns, thinner wire for the windings, less turns, less capacitance by building the transformer this way. So um, next slide. Um, I have, I'm not, I think I'm going to skip this slide. It, it kind of gets in the weeds, but basically what I was going to show was I take the antenna with the transformer in place and I sweep it over the whole frequency range across from 40 all the way to 10 meters. And I point out that this, well, actually, no, let's do this. This is probably one of the key takeaways. So let me, let me, let me do this one. I'll kill this model and go get the next model, which is this one. Enable it. I think it's already been run. So really what I want to show you is just the SWR. Here we go. Okay, so this is an off-center fed dipole fed through a transformer appropriately. It was designed to be resonant perfectly in the 40 meter band, which you see here. It's a one-to-one -one SWR right in the middle of the band. And I swept it all the way up to 10 meters. Now look what happened. We get three other beautiful dips that are way low, 1.2 SWR, 1.3 SWR, but they miss 
the 20 meter band right there. They miss the 15 meter band right there. And they, and this one misses the 10 meter band. So we have a perfectly good, multi, potentially good multiband antenna if we can only move these resonances a little bit lower. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, that slide had a lot of other data I'm gonna ignore and simply go to the next slide. I've already said it, the third, second, third and fourth resonances are too high. So uh, the wire acts like it's too short on the harmonics. So how do we fix that? Well, there's two ways you can fix it potentially. One way you can do it is you can add a little loading coil in the wire somewhere. And what that loading coil does is it makes the antenna wire act longer and it acts longer more the higher the harmonic. So by the time you get up to 10 meters, the loading coil has a bigger effect than it does on say 20 meters. Okay, there's another way to do it. And that is you can add a capacitor in the wire and because the capacitor acts, is getting closer to being a short circuit, the higher you go in frequency, its effect applies mostly to the fundamental and the second harmonic. By the time you get to the third and the fourth, not much is happening. So let's fix our prototype and fed. And I'm going to choose to do it with the capacitor method, not the inductor method. Almost all the commercial antennas use the inductor I personally think the capacitor is better. So how do we do it? It takes yet another model. <laughs> Here we go. Sorry about that. I don't want to save it. And I want to load the next one. And I want to show you what I did to the model to make it possible to align those harmonics first. So let's go to here and we'll just execute the model one time so I can show you the antenna. Okay, here is the antenna after I add the capacitor that fixes the harmonic lineup. Now, I also, while I was doing this, I realized that, okay, this is a horizontal dipole type antenna and typically it's gonna be coax fed. And remember that this part of the antenna could be a wire, but it could also be the coax that's feeding it. So realizing that you're most likely to run that coax vertically, not horizontally out axially from the wire, I actually turned the corner with it. It doesn't change the resonances very much, but it shows you that if you end the coax at the same place that that phony wire was ending before, you get your current distribution and this magic happens. So I op use the auto, uh, in the simulator, I use the optimizer to actually find, let me, let me see if I can show, yeah, here we go. So the solution that I found for where to put the capacitor involves the optimization based on the overall length of the wire, which is that variable, the uh, position down the coax of the eventual choke for now, just the end of the coax, the position of the capacitor along the main wire and the actual capacitance that I need to add. So I optimize on four variables and I'm trying to hit four frequencies. Well, that gives the optimizer enough variables to actually be able to solve that set of problems. And I found an answer and let me show you what it does. That is probably the most useful thing to show you. And that would be custom. And uh, let, me, let me make it a little bit more understandable by showing the SWR versus frequency, turning on the dots. Okay, so this is the SWR of that transformer fed, near end fed, offset fed wire still about 67 feet long, but now we have uh, SWR nulls that align pretty well with the bands. This one is still perfectly centered. This one is slightly favoring the low end of the band. This one is fa slightly favoring the upper end of the band. And this one, it happens to be right where you want it at about 28.5 or 28.6. But that's a pretty usable antenna, coax fed, 
that would not require tuning at all to hit four bands. What's not to like? All right. Um, what's the next thing to show you? Um, Pat, okay, take my word for it. The patterns haven't changed. Now, there's a, an issue that I raise when I add a capacitor to a wire, and that is the, the wire, the, the piece of wire beyond the capacitor, beyond, uh, on the opposite side of the transformer, is isolated by the dielectric of the capacitor. Okay, so... If you got the wind blowing across that wire, tribal electricity will charge that sucker up to thousands of volts potentially, and that will break down the insulation in the capacitor. So how do you prevent that? Well, you put a, a simple carbon resistor like 33K across the capacitor to bleed off the static, problem solved. So here is that network. This is exactly the network that I ended up putting in that ARRL kit antenna, 200 picofarads, which is what my optimizer found as the optimum value, shunted with the 33K ohm. I put it in a little housing. Those are the actual antenna wires. And uh, this picture uh, was taken out the front, uh, view of, uh, front view of my hangar. The hangar door is open. This antenna is actually a long ways away. It's, and it was, the wires were so skinny, I had to trace over and make them visible. On this picture, this coax is 100 feet long. It's RG8, or R, yeah, it's RG8. That's where the transformer goes. That little capacitor assembly that I just showed you ends up about 40% of the way along the wire from uh, the transformer. Remember, this from here to here is about 67 feet, and it just so happens that little uh, assembly with the capacitor and the, and the resistor ended up about here. Now, I built this thing and I hung it up like this. I had a, a 40 foot mass, two 40 foot mass. This is cord and the, this is cord going over to the other mass. So the antenna is pretty well isolated. It's not coupled to any metal. It's just hanging out there in space. And I didn't put a choke on this one, but this coax is about 100 feet from there all the way inside the building. And a lot of that coax is laying on the dirt, or part of it was laying on this reinforced uh, concrete. Well, I measured the, uh, the uh, common mode uh, down at the transmitter end of that cable, and there was virtually none. Well, here's my conclusion, and that is that this coax is long enough to where a lot of it is laying on the dirt. Laying on the dirt is as good as an RF choke. <laughs> and laying on rebar reinforced concrete is especially good as a choke. So I have no common mode problem with even without a, a common mode choke, which should have been about here, about that far below the transformer. Okay. Um, where are we on? We're at 17. What does 18 show us? Oh, okay. So this is the actual uh, ARRL kit that I bought and put together, and I, I tried it well, with my transformer, with their transformer, without a choke, with, uh, with a choke. I tried it my way of compensating the frequency harmonic alignment. Nobody, I haven't seen that published, by the way. That's kind of an original idea. So here's the actual antenna performance. The SWR on 40 meters, happened to land almost perfectly in the middle of the band, just like the model predicted it would. The 20 meter one is a little bit on the low side, just like the model predicted it should be. The uh, 15 meter one is a little bit uh, high relative to the band edges. That's clear up at 21.7, so the top, top of the band's about here. Um, the 20 meter one is right in the middle of the phone band, uh, 20, 28, 5, 28, 6. What is not to like? Look at that SWR. So, uh, okay, so at this point, I'm at a, I'm, I've shown you a practical antenna. I can give you a link to where all the dimensions of how to build that antenna are. If you're lazy, you can order the kit for about 60 bucks from the ARRL. If you're cheap like I am, you can buy the 
ferrite toroid from Chris in your own backyard for about 10 bucks and build your own for the cost of the wire and the cost of the coax. So uh, I want to put a break here and see if this uh, going this far has generated any questions. So uh, what say you, the audience? I will unshare so you can see my face. Hang on a second. There we go. Comments, questions? Uh, Mike, one quick one that I had. Um, we talked about this a little bit uh, before. Uh, this is Tom, WA7ZRG. Why, why don't you mention why you had a preference for using a capacitor to do their, uh, your network with as opposed to an inductor that most people have been using in the past? Okay, I've done it both ways. I've, sim I've used a simulator to study uh, how well it works both ways. And I found an advantage to the capacitor method in it does a better job of actually aligning the harmonics to the centers of the bands. That's, that's the technical reason. A practical reason is that when I tell you that you need to wind an inductor that is 6.872 microhenries, that is a problem for you if you don't own an impedance bridge. Or, you know, you can go buy a 200 picofarad capacitor and be reasonably assured that it's a 200 picofarad capacitor. But if I tell you to wind a 6.8 microhenry coil, it might not be 6.8 microhenry. So that, I think that's another practical reason why the capacitor method is preferred. It's also lighter. The capacitor and the resistor in that little piece of heat shrink or whatever you want to put it on in the middle of the wire, it, you know, occupies a whole lot less space and a whole lot less weight. Yes, yeah, what I kind of liked about it as well was the fact that you could just go buy a, a part off the shelf, if you will, and, and put it together and you don't have to have any special skills with building a coil that, that manages to hit the inductance that you want. One other okay. thing that- I was just going to say, uh, it, it turns out the capacitor requirement is that it be a pretty good RF capacitor. It's passing a, at 100 watts of RF on the 40 meter band, it's passing about one amp of RF during transmit. So it's a silver mica happens to be the right kind of capacitor because it has very low power dissipation and very low loss. So it doesn't self heat while you're transmitting. A crappy capacitor might overheat and burn up. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So would you have any reservations if you were running more than 100 watts? If I was running a kilowatt through that capacitor, I'd be looking for one that is much physically bigger and has a much higher voltage breakdown rating than the one I use for the 100 watt version. Oh, good. All right. Thanks. Uh, let's see. I have uh, there's three questions from the uh, spectators. Gary Crum asks, how did you measure common mode current with a probe and spectrum analyzer or what? Uh, um, I built my own instrument and I was going to add a picture uh, to my slideshow and I forgot. Uh, it's basically a ferrite toroid, the window of which is big enough to pass an SO239 already pre-soldered on a piece of RG8 coax. I wound about 50 turns of very fine copper wire around the outside of that toroid. I hooked that to a burden resistor of about 50 ohms carbon non-inductive, and I rectify the voltage across that uh, burden resistor and use it to drive a 50 microamp meter. Okay, so I have a hand, hand instrument that I can thread onto a piece of coax, and, I can, and it's got a kind of a wooden handle on it, so I can, while I'm transmitting, I can actually walk along the coax and slide this little indicator along the coax. Well, any place where there's a standing wave of common mode, at the peaks, the meter reads the highest. So I calibrated that 50 microamp meter movement by building a jig where I use my 100 watt transmitter to create the maximum amount of common mode current it can possibly produce passed that through the toroid, and I calibrated the meter in watts, uh, a relative indication based on a 100 watt reference. And if you get uh, indications that are 10% or less of that full scale 
uh, common mode current that you can possibly produce with a 100 watt transmitter, uh, it's totally benign. So, you, you know, in any given installation, you don't ever make the common mode be absolutely zero. But as long as it's low enough, then, then it doesn't get into the speakers on the PC and it doesn't crash your mouse. It doesn't crash your keyboard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a relative indicator and it works pretty well. You can buy that instrument, by the way, from MFJ uh, for a few bucks. Uh, I, I don't remember. Somebody else makes one as well. And there are circuits on the internet showing how to build it. Um, oh, you're, yeah, okay. That's basically it. Uh, the, there's the common mode excitation. Oh, you're, you're doing, or Clint is doing it. Yes, and there's yes. the burden resistor. There's an optimum turns ratio. There's a single turn here, and there's a multiple turn secondary. And um, I actually simulated that to find out how many turns I should put on the ferrite to get the right uh, uh, transformation. Now, it turns out uh, the, it, this, this turns ratio on that transformer is like 30 to 1 or 35 to 1. And so if the burden resistor is 50 ohms, the effective resistance you're putting in series with the current on the common mode thing that you're sensing is like 1 30th of the burden resistor. So it, it, work, it all works out. It's really clever. Right. I have one here on my 630 meter transmission line, and it's just a clamp on choke. So I can, one of those. Yeah, I, I, I tried that. And, and I, I don't like clamp on chokes because I can, if you get even a flake of dirt between the two mating surfaces, they, it changes their coupling and all that crap. So I use a solid ferrite core and I happen to have one that was the right mix that just slides over a PL259. So you can unscrew a cable, slide this thing on, screw the cable back on and then walk it along the cable. Yeah, I, I think a T140 core is about is the, the right, right yeah, size. That's the right core, yes, you're right. Right, okay. right. Any other and questions? probably mix... Mix 52 or 61 or maybe I think I 43. used 41, I think. I think I used 41. Yeah. yeah, a single turn shouldn't affect much, right? Okay, another question that Paul Plack had, AE4KR, was what happens if you built, built this thing vertically? I mean... The, the NFED? Well, yeah. funny, you, funny you should mention that. Uh, about the last three slides of the presentation okay. we'll, deal with we'll that come, issue. We'll come back to that. Uh, John Gardner asks... Have you seen W, I mean, K6ARK's QRP antenna? He has the capacitor right by the toroid. Why there instead of 40% down the wire? Any ideas? Oh, you're talking about the capacitor in the transformer? Um, I'm reading what it says. Um, I, I'm wondering if he's referring to the optimizing capacitor for the other bands. Maybe the person doesn't need to optimize four bands. Okay, uh, let, let me back up. Uh, can I share the screen and, and sure. go back to a slide? Let me, let me unshare. Am I still sharing? No, I see your face. Okay, good. Well, okay. sorry about that, but okay. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Okay. And it'll take me a second to find that uh, slide of the transformers. Where were they? Oh, let's see. No transformers. They were up here. So there we go. Okay, can you see that capacitor right there? Right. That's, that's right across the 50 ohm input. Is that the capacitor he's talking about? Um, let's see, I went to, apparently K6ARK makes antennas. So perhaps um, John Gardner, you might clarify it. Is he talking about the compensating capacitor that's on the primary side of things? Or is he talking about one that's in the wire? Um, um, and they're two different, they operate for two entirely different reasons. See, there, the, I, the home built version, there's my those, those are 200 picofarads each, and they're in series making a 100 picofarad capacitor. The capacitor in the AWRL kit is about 100 picofarads that comes in the kit. Uh, I've taken apart uh, commercial transformer uh, boxes like for my antennas, and typically this compensating this comp this capacitor compensates for some reactants in the transformer it has nothing to do with the frequency uh align the, the harmonic alignment compensation 
yeah, in the John, wire. John Gardner simply said yes. So I, 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 he yes. might, <laughs> yeah, yes. he might clarify if it's yes, the capacitor you're pointing to, or <laughs> I, I think he is. He'll clarify it. But another question was asked is David Soss wonders, what's the voltage rating of the capacitor? I noticed that you used 500 volt caps. So the worst case, I presume, would be the lowest frequency were, you know, 40 meters. The simulator, by the way, the simulator, you can ask the simulator, the antenna simulator, what is the voltage across this capacitor at any given uh, application in an antenna element at any given frequency and so on. So with 100 watts, the 500, the, the, the maximum RMS RF voltage that ever appears across the compensating capacitor in the wire is about 80 volts RMS. Okay. Okay. The, the highest current that I ever saw in that capacitor was about 1.2 amps of RF at okay. 100 watts input. So yeah. you would you would have to scale those up. Uh, you know, if you're going to run 1500 watts, you'd have to scale those up by a factor of about four and a half or something. Five, yeah. yeah, yeah. I know the 500 volt caps. They're good for somewhere around an amp, and the, the thousand volt caps are caps are probably good for three ish amps. But yes. you know, uh, otherwise the way, I, they will melt themselves apart. But yes. if you need more current, you just put more in parallel. I, I actually tested one of those on the bench. I have a thermal camera, and the five hundred peak, the excuse me, the two hundred picofarad silver mica that I used didn't even get lukewarm with a hundred watts going through it. I mean, it was just, it didn't even phase it. So I think you could actually run a lot more current than you're saying. Uh, uh, Mark Hodge and WU7F asks, is it possible to use this end fed with a single mast? If so, the transformer at the bottom of the sloper, inverted V or top of the mast. And you might make a, I think you've touched on this before. It doesn't matter what kind of dipole you make. The most important thing to do is make the middle as high as possible because that's where the current is and that's yes. where the RF flies off it. Yes, yes, and yes, and yes. Uh, the Actually, uh, all things being equal, I prefer to put uh, all of my horizontal wires as far from dirt as possible. Now. Right. Uh, the, 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 we can't. We are going to get back to the question of how do you make a vertical antenna, a, a Marconi antenna, out of an end fed. So should we head head there now? Let's see. There's a um, okay. Uh, there's he, okay. John Gardner said the one by the connector. So that's a temperature compensation. The one nice one of the nice things about an end fed half wave and and Mike uh, Colette and I used one in in Canyonlands was that the nice thing about it is you can raise the middle of the antenna with a with a flimsy pole because there ain't weight up there if you, you you take the you you take the strain off by where the transformer is with another rope and insulator and all you're doing is lofting a, a flimsy wire and you can use almost any cheapo pole for that and okay. the money is where where the the middle of the dang wire okay here's my here's a summary slide I skipped way ahead okay I say a monoband end fed half wave might as well be a dipole. That's sort of a statement I made, but here's the exceptions. Stealth and HOA applications where you can use a nearly invisible 22 gauge wire, as long as you hide the transformer in one tree and you, hand, and you hide the insulator in the other tree. Uh, okay, another idea is a structural one. That is if you don't want coax hanging off the middle of a wire, if you've got rather flimsy supports, no center support required with a end fed. Uh, and then we, uh, um, I've, I haven't talked about this part of it yet, but with an inverted L Marconi end fed, it's a way to eliminate having to have radials. So uh, are we done with the interruption? Can I go back? Yeah, to yeah. yeah. We've gotten the questions out of the way. If anyone has other questions, uh, put them in there. So, um, okay, so uh, a quick, quickly, I think we got to the point of feeding it with coax, talking about chokes. Here's a couple of slides on chokes. Have I shown these before? I haven't, have I? No. no. Okay, so here's some ways of building chokes for coax. 
putting ferrite beads on coax and putting heat shrink tubing over it. That's called a Maxwell choke. Wrapping coax around a uh, FT240 31 type guanella choke. Here's one I made. Uh, that core came from Chris, KF7P. And this is Teflon coax. It's nominally 50 ohms. It's slightly smaller than RG58. And I've run a kilowatt through it and it doesn't even phase it. So, so th here's an example of how to build your own choke. By the way, I leave my stuff exposed. I see no reason to put that in a weatherproof box. As long as the sun can't shine on it and screw it up, why not leave it open? And uh, I, I make the substrates that I put these things on. This is vinyl fencing that some scraps came from my neighbor's house. I put it in a table saw and I just cut it up and make these little sort of half boxes out of them. Um, here is a slide I stole from DX Engineering showing the difference between winding a, a, a simple wind around a, a, to, a toroid core versus doing a choke with the crossover winding in the middle. You notice that the crossover winding has a higher impedance uh, over quite a wide frequency range, actually from here all the way over to about here, uh, just by keeping the output side of the, of the thing further away from the input. You want to reduce the parasitic capacitance across the choke, and the crossover winding is a way of accomplishing that. Uh, let's see, uh, where am I? I lost my, which, uh, that one doesn't have a slide number on it, so I can't tell which is the next slide. Ah, I happened to hit it perfectly. Okay, here's a really important uh, graphic. Uh, some people have recently taken uh, an FT240 core, type 31 ferrite, which is the best material for building Ferrite, coax, chokes, one-to-one balance, -one balance, line isolators, whatever the hell you want to call them. RG400 is that Teflon coax, similar to what I showed, the white stuff. And this is the number of turns wrapped around the core along this axis. And this axis is frequency. And the color shows where the thing is a really good choke, where it's a pretty good choke, where it's a moderately good choke, and these two colors down here are where it stops being effective as a choke. So if you want a choke to cover from 80 meters to let's say 10 meters, you could do worse than 12 turns. See, it's, it starts below, uh, it starts below 3.5 megahertz, and it's pretty good all the way up to about 25, 26, and it's still pretty good even at 10 meters. It's still got a, a, a series uh, impedance of between two and 4,000 ohms. So this is posted on my wall and I refer to it from time to time. Uh, it, if you, uh, I will put a link to this uh, image in, in the informational, uh, in the resource information at the end of the slideshow. Okay, um, 27. Okay, so we talked about practical horizontal Hertz type end feds. They're ground independent, single band is easy, tunes backwards, you gotta add wire to raise frequency. Uh, Multi-band requires the coil or cap in the wire to compensate it. And here's some useful combinations. If you start with a 273 or so foot wire, you can build an end fed that works 160, 80, 60, 40, 20. And that's the one I built for Leamington. Uh, if you start with 137 foot wire, you can build an end fed that works on 80, 40, 20, 17, 15, and 10, maybe 12. Uh, it's pretty close. And that, an example of that, you can buy those ready made from people like my antennas. Uh, that's AWRL kit that I referred to that you can buy online is a 67 foot version. It covers 40, 20, 15, and 10. If you do my compensation trick with the capacitor, my compensation trick with the capacitor is better than HF kits compensation trick with an inductor. Uh, it, theirs is very hard to follow and I don't think it would work. 
Um, okay, it's best to add the choke. We talked about that. So here's some pictures. You've all seen it, the Leamington site. I, I came up with this antenna that's actually installed down there. It's about 14 feet of coax, which hangs off the rope. This is a piece of rope from here to here. That's a, a common mode choke that I made myself out of ferrite and coax. I think this one was about 15 or 18 turns of coax on an FT uh, 240-31 type core. This is a grounded tower. So what I'm trying to do with that choke is to isolate the antenna from the grounded tower. If you connected those two together, whatever common mode current would, would be flowing along that coax has a path to ground all the way down the tower. And if you happen to hit the wrong length, you might run into some trouble with that. So the choke just makes it bulletproof. Why, what's not to like? Okay, here's the transformer. This happens to be a 50 ohm in to 2450 ohm out. Um, it, it's a commercial one I happen to have laying around. Uh, I optimized the wire. In this case, I use a little coil. This is before I learned the capacitor trick. And this works pretty well, but it makes the antenna resonate on 160, 80, 60, 40, and at least 20 meters, and maybe a couple of the higher ones. And finally, there's just rope going to the rest of the way to the ground. Now, since that antenna was installed, it fell down once. It quit working. You know why? Because there was a brush fire and it burned that cord. <laughs> that was something I didn't anticipate. <clears throat> okay. It, it turns out uh, the optimizer taught me that I needed a 6.2 microhenry coil. Uh, and that was may I, I custom made that by winding about 19 turns of wire on a one and a half inch PVC tube and it, it made it work. So anyway, there's, there's a, a, a practical example. Here's a commercial example. This is the, my antennas, uh, 80 through 10. Uh, it's about 129 feet of wire. There's a compensating coil. There's where the coax hooks up. That's the same, that connector right there, where I call it tail, is ohmically connected to the, to the threaded bushing on the, so if you wanted to ground it, or if you wanted to uh, install this like an, uh, an, an end-fed vertical, that's where you'd hook the ground up. Uh, this, is the, my, this is the kit you can buy from the ARRL. This is right off their webpage. And I think they were charging $69 for the kit, which is okay because the, the quality, it's a, all the components are high quality. Um, all right. So do we have time for this last three slides? Um, let's see. I was going to, I was going to uh, unshare for a second. I was going to show something I just happened to do last time I was at Leamington. Okay. And let's you want to go back to that picture or you, you're going to take your, uh, you're going to take over. Yeah. Un unshare and I'll bring this up and. Okay. Uh, stop share. Okay. So, um, so there you go. That's self-explanatory. Um, that's where. The, the, these are the frequencies on which the antenna you built for Lemington actually works. Well, so, okay. so, so this is done from the well, radio. 160 end. is pretty narrow, or 160 is real narrow, which you expect. Right. Then, then that's in the middle of the seven. That's low in the 75 meter band. It's about 3.8. Right. Eight. But the radio has a three, three and a half to one tuner built in. So, so, it does, so, so, so it you does okay. It okay. And that's 60 meters. That's right. pretty good. And then uh, there's 40 is pretty good. And then, uh, then 20 is fine. Yep. And, and then, uh, th then uh, just we're catching the tail edge of 17. Yes. Uh, 21, 15 is, you know, not great to the low no. end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, by the way, the, the ant an antenna that starts out as long as this one is 260 right. feet, I wouldn't, I probably would never try to use it up in here anyway. No, because no. the Patterns get so bizarre up there that, the, that, that yeah. The the other thing too is that the harmonic relationship strikes me as falling apart because by the time you get up to ten meters, a couple of puff is a huge proportion of the capacitance of the impedance, and everything goes to crap. 
Yes. If you make right. a transformer that works at 160, it ain't going to work with work the darn above. Yeah, and that's why I, I think you're doing good to get up, to get to 20 meters with that antenna, personally. Right. right. The only other question, comment, too, is that the Lemington antenna actually broke this summer. Yes. But what happened was that the box got pulled apart. So we just simply... <laughs> because oh. because 100, 150 pounds is being pulled on the plastic box, so we just added another rope, to, and then oh, uh, bridge bridge it around the box with a yeah, rope, uh, uh, bypass the load. So the box is most uh, being held together with electrical tape and a whole lot of RTV at this point. <laughs> okay, uh, it's fine now. We don't care. Well, anyway. you should rebuild that antenna. I mean, that that was. I think it's held up pretty well. Oh, yeah, actually. yeah. Uh, Gary points out too that. Fortunately, only one of the one of the ropes on the far end got burned by the brush fire. We've since replaced one of the two ropes with a piece of wire, a cable, but we have to do the other rope. Anyway, uh, go on and show the vertical since that was already out. Okay, we're 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 down to only two or three slides, so we'll we'll make it quick here. Right. Uh, all and right. Gary, Gary points Gary. out that the pole fell over, but since it crosses a ravine, it was just like forty feet lower suddenly. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, so how about a Marconi M-fed halfway? Marconi is named after Guillermo, and basically what we want to do is use the earth below the antenna, below the transformer, in lieu of that short wire that I've been showing as part, an, in, an intrinsic part of the M-fed antenna. So uh, here I'm going to load another model, so I'm going to have to abandon that model and go get the appropriate one. That's that one. Okay, so let's look at what, we, uh, what we're gonna do here. First of all, um, I'm gonna show you, calculate the page. Okay, that one, I'm gonna execute the model once. Oh, wait a minute. Now this is an interesting warning. If uh, those of you that can read this, it says, Selected wire in row 18 extends into or lies completely below ground. Valid only with the neck four or five engine and a high extended accuracy ground type. That's a warning to me that says that, hey, dummy, we're now having to revert to using the neck five computational engine because we're modeling a buried conductor, okay? So uh, to do that, I have to go to the options tab on uh, easy. By the way, this is the beta release of what Tom Llewellyn's going to release, or uh, Lou, Lou, what's his name? Excuse me, Llewellyn. I can't think of his first name. Is going to release into the public domain. It's going to be called something other than uh, the earlier version, which was version six. Um, okay, so I got to go to the options tab, and up here I got to say, hook it up to the external NEC5 engine, which is what I just did. Now I go to the model itself, and I uh, execute this first line, and I show you the antenna. Okay, so here what I've done is I built a NFED antenna where I, I'm not using a transformer. I'm just going to use a source and and see what the feed point impedance is. But it's a one segment above ground. That line right there represents the, the level of the dirt. So this represents a ground rod driven below the antenna. So this antenna specifically is a quarter wave monopole driven against an eight foot ground rod. And the ARRL handbook tells you that this doesn't work very well. Why doesn't it work very well? Well, because the current is highest right near the feed point. The current is highest into the ground rod. The ground rod is a high resistance, maybe 50 to 100 ohms. And you're dissipating a, most of your RF transmitter power in the ground rod resistance in inch within inches of where the ground rod is buried in the dirt. Yeah, they call those worm warmers, as I recall. That's a, yeah, they call it earth earth a wor earth worm warmer. So the efficiency of this antenna totally sucks. About eighty percent of hundred watts gets consumed in that ground rod resistance right there. And the reason is is because that current is so high, the loss is proportional to I squared, right? 
I squared R. So I is high, I squared is even higher, the resistance is high, so that's where all your power goes. This is a sh and pardon my French, this is not a very good antenna. <laughs> okay, so let's fix it. One thing we can do to fix it is make it twice as long. That was a quarter wave monopole. Here's a half wave monopole. I'm going to execute that model right there and view that antenna. Now look at the difference. This is a half wave vertical. The feed point's in the same place. I'm, I can get by with making a shorter ground rod. I actually made this ground rod only four feet tall. And notice that the current right there where the feed point is, is much, much, much less. It's actually about one sixth or one seventh of what it was in the other model. So if you square six, the difference is 36. So you're losing one thirty-six of the power with this antenna that you were with a quarter wave monopole driven against an eight foot ground rod. So this is actually a tenable, a doable antenna, except for one thing. Most people can't, um, tolerate a monopole that is 65.9 feet tall. I mean, it'd be wonderful if I could put something that tall in my backyard, but I'd, I'd be hard pressed to do it. And, and a guy living in suburbia would especially be hard pressed to do it. So here's an idea. How about we modify the model? By the way, I'm, I wrote a model that models all three without changing, having to reload any files. This uh, variable S, switches it to, watch, what do we call one of the, oh, wait a minute, why didn't that work? Calculate, okay, now we go, there we go. Okay, what do we call one of those? Well, we call that an inverted L. It's just like the straight up uh, NFED half wave, except we bend it at approximately the middle. So this is now about a quarter wave. So that makes it about the same height as the 33 foot monopole uh, the, that needs radials, and we've added this wire off to the right or left, doesn't matter which, which way we orient it. Now, here's what I want to show you. Here are the patterns of those three instances of that model. The blue one is the original monopole with the ground rod under it, and it's very lossy. So you notice that the power is down almost 9 dB in its maximum radiation area below the red, the outer marker that, here. Which that, is, that's one and a half S units if you're counting. Yes. And that's about, that's about, uh, about 90 or eight or nine dB. And that's about how much power you're losing. So uh, this is the uh, pure half wave vertical. And it's, it's, it's about almost two divisions so that's almost an S unit better. Uh, that, that efficiency is, is considerably better. And if you bend that top over, the antenna has slightly less low angle radiation down in here. The crossover is right at that point, but from here on up, you're getting a lot of high angle stuff. So it's actually a really good antenna for what we do on Sunday mornings. Because right. I mean, for, it's, I mean, going from the original antenna vertical with the ground rod to that one is just like adding a linear. Yes, absolutely. That's a good way to put it. So what's not to like about that? The idea is now there is one minor drawback. Let me show you what it is. Let's go back to the feet point impedance. Now, I made no attempt to feed this with a transformer. I'm simply asking what is the feed point impedance of that inverted L? Well, if the antenna wire goes straight up, it's around 3000 ohms. If you bend the half of the antenna over, it starts getting a little bit higher, around 4,500 ohms. So could you accommodate that with one of our ferrite transformers? Well, the answer is yes. If you put an eight to one turns ratio on a ferrite transformer, that's a 64 to one impedance ratio. 64 times 50 is 3,200. So that's most of the way there. Uh, you, you know, the SWR would only be about one and a half to one if you used a one to eight transformer on that feed point. So I think it works. I, I haven't built one. I'm gonna, it's on my to-do list. I actually wanna try one of these just for giggles and actually uh, make it right. Okay, so let me 
so, real so, quick. So I guess what you're talking about is a flagpole with the number twenty with the number twenty six wire coming off it. Yes, yes, uh, uh, actually, or or uh, a fiberglass pole with a wire up through the middle of it. I'm actually but, thinking. I'm actually thinking of using one of these for my RV antenna. Right, I've right. got a I've got a thirty three foot telescoping fiberglass pole, so I could end feed the wire from the from the frame of the trailer going up. And then bend the top over with a side wire, right? Although you got to be careful about uh, fiber uh, poles. If you use carbon fiber, uh, George uh, KJ Six VU discovered that they you make it up? no, no, they, they make <laughs> they suck up power. You got to keep oh. if, if you're using a carbon fiber pole, you got to keep any antenna radiating antenna wire quite you know, a ways away to, from it. Yeah, quite a ways away from it. Otherwise, it just it just acts as a dummy load, a linear dummy well, load. Well, you know, my, my pole is advertised as being fiberglass. I don't think it's got carbon fiber in it. I'll have to check. Yeah, it, it's too expensive for them to accidentally put that in. Okay. Um, all right, so here's a summary. We've actually showed part of that before. So here's that resources slide. A lot of these links will end up being uh, visible on my QRZ uh, personal page. So I'll, I'll put all of these at the bottom, plus some others that I plan on adding. So anybody that wants to try to build an antenna, uh, at, at least we'll be able to go to somewhere where they can get some starting dimensions and that sort of thing. And you can email me and ask me questions. I'll be happy to help you out. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to be inundated, but, uh, Bob, but you know, good, good old members from U UARC uh, deserve special attention. So there you go. Right. Is it, is it your call sign at awrl.net? Will that work? Yes, awrl.net. Yes, yeah. my call sign. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. So I think we've beat it to death. Any other questions? Uh, nothing so far. Um, let's see. Let's. Uh, somebody in the. If you have a question and you're on the YouTube chat, uh, send them now. Uh, anyone on the board? Hey, Tom, you have a question, right? No, I'm, I'm questionless. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, we've heard. Uh, Tom, we being speech, Tom being speechless is a is a rare opportunity. Now be careful. I'll think of something. <laughs> okay, uh, nothing so far. So, um, well, I mean, one thing that I will comment on: uh, Clint gave me an assignment at the beginning of the presentation. To uh, Mike has given us. Uh, he's talked about antennas before, and he started off. Uh, mostly just the, the simple dipole. And we have that presentation and that's uh, currently available on our YouTube channel. If you do want to go back and look at that, that was uh, given on the, um, just looking at my notes here. It looks like it was on, on May 13th of uh, last year. Uh, you, another, you can get the another COVID presentation. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And uh, but it, and it dealt with just the simple dipole and, and some of these tools that Mike is kind of uh, taking some liberty with today to show us how they work. So if you wanted to go back and get that information, you could do now, that now, to open a very small can of worms or actually one of those snakes that squirts everywhere. Uh, in, in one word, Mike, tell us if you've ever found a a uh, commercial stealth antenna that disguised as a flagpole that you think works worth a darn. No. <laughs> there <laughs> no you go. <laughs> no word. No. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a company that has a history of uh, uh, that is in was in Park City, Utah, uh, that made a big deal of flagpole antennas on on QRZ.com and eham. And a lot of people sent that guy money and never got any product. So uh, there's there, there's kind of a uh, a bad black eye for Utah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. There ain't yeah no I have a question. Uh, and also, after after Morris, uh, there's the one of the other darling antennas that's harder to that isn't as popular probably because it's harder to build would be the skeleton um, slot antenna. But Morris, go ahead. Well, the question I have is, how straight does this antenna need to be? Um, it, it can be, you could do to it, you could do to it anything you could do to a dipole. 
Now, is it going to affect the tuning slightly? Yes, it will. In other words, all my modeling was done straight, more or less straight lines. When I hung it up in free space to actually test it, it was hung up more or less in straight lines. People have been trying to figure out how to deploy these things where they go sideways around corners and all that kind of stuff. And I think the general experience is, is that if the antenna was perfect before they started by bending it, they probably moved some of the resonances around or they, uh, you know, so you may have to experiment a little bit. Um, the good news is if you can describe the geometry, you actually want to put the thing in creating a model and actually modeling it isn't, isn't very hard. <laughs> so, and the model will frequently smoke out some of those uh, problems before you actually build the antenna. Right, I've right, been, yeah. I, by the way, I, 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 just, I, just, I just want to make this point. I've been modeling antennas now for four or five years. I've built several of the antennas I've modeled. I've modeled antennas people have previously built kind of to second guess how they work. And the correlation between what the modeler predicts and the way the antenna physically works is remarkable. I mean, I, I never cease to be amazed at how well the modeling matches the actual behavior of the antenna or vice versa. So, the moments. That's, uh, but there, you, you got you to gotta model all aspects of the antenna. You can't take shortcuts. So, but, Well, yeah, on, on that, I think we touched on it before. It, well, however you zigzag the antenna, try to keep the middle of it as high as possible because that's where the money is. And for, with any antenna, wire antenna, don't fold it back on itself. Uh, yes. If you yes, can help it. More, it. Yes. It's kind of, no more than a 90-degree bend. Right. Let's see here. Um, uh, uh, KE6SLS asks, a question, if I can only have one antenna, would be a doublet or an NFAD half wave? And that's sort of a... That's a whole meeting. That is a whole meeting unto itself. And well, if, if I had to have one antenna, I can tell you what I would pick, which is the one I use now. And I, I know you opine on that too. And it's I, not an NFAD half wave. It's, not, it's neither of those two. It's a, it's a loop. That's what I would like. A, a horizontal loop. It's a pain in the butt to feed. But if you have a tuner and window line, BFD, right? No big deal. Well, it's it's actually uh, the, my loop doesn't need a tuner at all. That's that's the beauty of a loop. It yeah, can, by the can... way, you don't have to compensate a loop like we just compensated the end fed. It's not the harmonics naturally align because there's no open ends of wires that cause end effect. Uh, now, I don't like doublets. I don't like ladder line. I don't like big tuners. I don't like thousands of volts of RF sitting six inches from my computer. So I don't like doublets. I think doublets should have been abandoned in 1936. I know that just totally <laughs> futzes off a whole bunch of hams because it's like a religion with them. They think the doublets are the end of the world. But you asked me, I told you. Yeah, I mean, if you're willing to put up with window line and high impedance and tra transformers. There's there's nothing wrong with them. Just d make darn sure you don't feed them with coax. You feed them with a the window line. Yes. I mean, right. Um, and, and I might mention too, that one of the reasons we can get away at Lemington with one, some of the weird bands is we have half inch heliacs running up there. So if it's, if it's 10 to one, we only get about as much loss as you would get on a, uh, a on ordinary coax, you know, because, you know, it, you know, not a whole lot worse. So um, David Sauce mentions finally that chameleon antenna suggests an inverted L with the transformer and feed point at the top and the bend point hanging down. Well, I mean, I, I, it, the drooping dipole is an old common one where you get so far because your yard's only six, you know, and you want to put up an 80 meter antenna in the 70 foot yard, you drop the 30 feet on each side. Yes, well, uh, would it be better to put the transformer 36 feet in the air, run coax up the pole, run a, a horizontal wire uh, roughly 35, 36 feet, and then drop the wire near ground? 
Okay, one thing you probably ought to think about there is the voltage that might appear at the end of that wire so nobody can touch it. Uh, that actually problem accrues right at the feed point of the uh, transformer, but hopefully that, uh, you know, your dog isn't going to raise its leg on the thing while you're transmitting. Well, th th that's that's a thing too. I mean, uh, uh, David Saw said, I meant the first part being antennas horizontal, but you know, when he described the bending part, but that's, that's the point though. I mean, the end, the, the feed end and the distal end are hot. Uh, are, if you, you'll, you'll get one hell of an RF burn off those. Either if, end. On either end, if you touch it. So, yes. I mean, you're, you're talking thousands of volts. I mean, I suppose you could set fire to something if you really tried hard. Well, it would, a kilowatt would be thousands of volts. A hundred a hundred watts is considerably less than that. It'd be a uh, it'd be a third of the voltage is all. Yeah, yeah, but that's enough. It's, it's enough to leave hundreds, a mark. It's, it's low hundreds. It's not thousands. Okay, right. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Paul Plack makes one final comment when you were talking about doublets. He said, "Mike, tell us what you really think." <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, I get anyway. into I, I write a lot on QRZ.com on the antenna forum, and I get into this trouble all the time. Right. So I've okay. heard it all before. Right. Okay. Well, I think that I think that gives gets us to the end of the meeting. So um I uh, thank you, Mike. We'll probably tap you again because <laughs> At some point, not, because not if, I, not if I see you coming, right, right. I mean, the the good the good thing about this is now you have a canned presentation. You can it, you have you have one in the can. So yeah, there you go. So anyway, all right. So appreciate that. Um, and I, upon what you call the can. That's true. <laughs> but yeah, we mean like film, of course. But yeah, and having. So when you give this presentation next time, you can either refer them to this YouTube chat or just reuse your slides, I guess, if it's in person, if we ever have those again. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for coming. And we really appreciate your uh, your knowledge and, and practical experience and the fact that uh, I, I was on the tower with you when we installed the NFAD half wave. And I was, it was freaky how close the actual chart matched your prediction. I mean, we only had to change the wire by like 10 or 15, you know, 10 feet to get it to match exactly. I think I think you cut it long on purpose because it's easier to cut wires long than short and right. stretch them out. So I yeah. had put the, I had put that antenna up here first okay. in a similar deployment, not exactly the same. So I had I had confidence that it was gonna work. Yeah, and and it's and it's worked fine. So yeah. no complaints. All right. Well that wraps us up for the evening. Appreciate it. Um from the board, any other comments or reminders? And Morris, briefly run down, remind people as to when the classes are. Uh the technician and general classes are Monday and Wednesday starting next week. If you're interested in taking them, please give me an email immediately. And the extra class will start a week from Tuesday, the 25th. And you can send me an email or K7RLS uh, at Comcast.net. All right, sounds good. And I didn't mention it before, and I had it, I should have written it down. If you want to take your test, go to hamstudy.org slash sessions, hamstudy.org slash sessions. I'll put it in the lower thirds when you're on the edit when you're talking and that'll tell you about online sessions anywhere in the u.s and it also includes in-person sessions here in utah if you would prefer that with that i think we are done hey tom unmute yourself do we know what next month's meeting is i'll put you on the spot uh i do not know what next month's meeting is but i'm sure that we will have that pretty well uh, talked about at our at our meeting uh, a week from today. Okay, I have an MPI might know. Um, I don't know. Uh, MTI, no? Mike, if you can unmute yourself, do you have a 
idea, if you're listening, if you have an idea of what next month's meeting is about. Bueller. Bueller. Going once, going Bueller. twice. Go anyway, on. so uh, we'll get that worked out. And it, it will not be Mike because uh, we wouldn't do that to him two months in a row. So anyway, uh, appreciate you for coming. And thanks for uh, hanging through the meeting. 7-3, and see you next month.